Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. A- 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 Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Ladies and gentlemen of the digital age, do you find yourself constantly with a ton of questions? Well, we've got the answers, or more specifically, Matthew Dickerson has the answers. Welcome to another episode of Tech Talk. How have you been, Matt? Yeah, good. I'm not sure if I've got all the answers, James. Wow, <laughs> you're building it right up there. But I've actually had a bit of isolation lately. I had to do seven days of isolation, close oh, contact, all that sort of fun. Smashed. And I've been trying to avoid Wordle. The wor- world has oh, been going crazy on Wordle. But I can't believe Wordle. <laughs> it's become the the most recent Pokemon version of Pokemon Go, hasn't it? Everyone's uh, on a Wordle. Everyone's on a Wordle. And What's I thought I've, I succumbed to it because we had four of us in isolation in the same household and we were all doing things <laughs> together. We went, right out. Well, we better get into this Wordle. Let's have a look at Wordle. And so I don't know if you've played much Wordle. Oh, my all. son has. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm a lectureless. That's an online Scrabble sort of uh, yeah, right. game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And the thing with Wordle that's interesting is I find it's one word a day, so you can't get too addicted to it because you do it once and, yeah, right. well, that's it. You know Go the on. word for that day, so that's that's that done. So I like that But it part. keeps you hanging for the next day. Well, it does <laughs> keep you hanging for the next day, but I like the fact that you can't consume your entire life with it, so I think that's really clever. But I've actually spent a bit of time looking at the opening word, the best opening word. So yeah, right. I'm still researching that, but... Roate, R-O-A-T, is a good yeah. opening word. Adieu is a good opening word. Because yeah, right. I don't so much, I mean, some people want to go for the word that's going to be the, maybe I'll get a hole in one. So it's probably never going to be Roate. It's not a common enough word to mm-hmm. worry about. But I like the idea of just doing a couple of words at the beginning, just to get a bit of a mixture of those common letters, a few common vowels. And then with those, you go, well, now let's start to actually put some maths into it, some science yeah, into it, and actually okay. come up with an answer rather than just some people I've spoken to have said, I don't know, have a bit of a guess, and that one wasn't right, have another guess, oh no, don't you go through and break it down. And I, I used to love playing <laughs> Mastermind, remember that game Mastermind? Yeah, where, yeah, for sure. Yeah, someone would put the, the guess there, and I'd always come up with these little scientific concepts and how I'd actually yeah. work away at it. It used to frustrate me when people would just randomly I guess. know, what were they thinking? What that? You've got to use a system. <laughs> yeah, that's right, so <laughs> Wordle now, so yes, I am playing Wordle now, I tried to avoid it, but it's amazing what happens when you're in isolation for seven days you've got to come up with things that you wouldn't normally do you just go to walk out the door to go oh I can't just go to the supermarket can I I've got to think about how I plan these things now it's quite strange well I wouldn't have gone with row eight I might have gone with all right but um yeah so I did need to attach a little disclaimer to my introduction this week specifically Matt Dickerson does have answers provided the questions are specifically about the nine topics that we've got at hand <laughs> that's right okay thank you I, much, just, I feel much more comfortable now yeah that's right we just need to establish that there needs to be a practical limit to that um, perhaps for example if people had questions about out whether or not their password is on the list of 2021's most terrible passwords. Or what about questions as to whether Apple can start my car now? Or maybe what about what's technology got to offer drinking straws? I reckon they're the sorts of questions that I was intending to in that initial intro. I've anyway. got the answers to those ones, so I'm covered now. Good. Yeah. Okay, we'll Thank get you. started then. Uh, we're pretty much familiar with airbags in cars now and how they work. I hope that you listeners aren't so familiar that you know what an airbag to the face feels like. Um, But did you know that airbags have been compulsory in car design since 1998, believe it or not? They've always been on the inside of the car, though, for the safety of the occupants, of course. Well, the delivery company Neuro has brought some more innovation to the airbag game, and they're all about protecting pedestrians now. Matt, they've literally been thinking outside the square here. They have been. Now, did you use mattresses as a kid? Did you put mattresses on the ground? <laughs> That's yeah. What I thought so. And didn't we all get yelled at by our parents for, like, destroying our bedrooms? That's and right. Stuff? And your sister's bedrooms and your brother's yeah, bedrooms yeah. and everyone. Because <laughs> mattresses, if you had mattresses there, you could do anything. You could try your triple somersaults with a double twist. And, and I remember um, WWF, it was back in, no, it was a WWE, maybe, um, you know, World Wrestling. Yep. Yep. That was a big thing with Big John Stard and Andre the Giant, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And we had to try out the moves. That's right. So you had matches on the walls, matches on the everywhere. floors, yeah, on yeah, the ceiling. You had to be able to bounce off the walls, yeah, for sure. Well, I reckon that someone in Neuro basically did the same thing as we did as kids. They had mattresses everywhere because they've got their little delivery car, their autonomous delivery car, and it's fantastic. It's The whole world is working towards autonomous vehicles now. A lot of So we're talking about a full-size car, not this little buggy that walks goes around on the uh, nature strip or whatever? No, it's it's kind of small. It is designed to drive on the roads, but it's a bit smaller than a normal car All right. because it doesn't need space for passengers. It only needs space for goods. But there has been a bit of a concern about whether or not this might run into a pedestrian, obviously injure oh, a pedestrian. Yeah. Now, they don't go at highway speed, but they still go along at a fair old pace. They're getting along around about 40 kilometres an hour, so that'd hurt. 
Anything London. that hits you at 40 kilometres an hour is going to hurt? Yeah, I reckon. So that's the, the concept here. Now, again, they're using a, a range of LiDAR and cameras to navigate around things. Obviously, the concept here is that they put a pizza in, they put some food goods in, whatever it might be, and off it goes on its journey to go and deliver that. So you don't have humans involved. Obviously, the concept is it makes it much cheaper to get goods from point A to point B, and we've got a bit of a staff shortage across the world now and a whole range Contactless of occupations. Contactless de- delivery as well. Yeah, yep. exactly right. So all sorts of good things from it, but again, people are worried about pedestrians being hit. So they've come up with the concept of an airbag. As you said, not on the inside of the car, but on the outside of the car. And when you look at the images of it, and I encourage anyone to go on Google Neuro, N-U-R-O, and have a look at the images of it, because it just looks like someone strapped a mattress to the front of the vehicle. (laughs) (laughs) So what I'm really confused about, though, is obviously there's got to be some trigger. There's got to be some point where it says, oh, no, there's James in front of me. I'm about to run into him. I'll trigger the airbag to make it a bit softer when I run into him. Well, if you've got that concept, well, why don't you just stop the vehicle <laughs> rather, yeah. than, rather than trigger the airbag? Because a normal airbag in a car has got a range of sensors in the front, for example, or different parts of the car. So as those sensors detect a deceleration or a, a deceleration above a certain level, then they say, oh, we're obviously running into something at the front part of the car before the occupant gets crushed in this, let's trigger the airbag. So yeah, right. there's a, there's a way let's assume they're not, they're not carting rhinoceroses or elephants here and they don't have so much momentum that they can't stop. Well, that's right. They're pretty light. The main part of the weight of these would be the battery. Obviously, they're an EV. So they've got battery down on the base. So they're not that heavy. But yeah, you think that you'd just try and pull it up. But anyway... Maybe it's just to make people feel safer about these little vehicles running around, yeah. and they see them and they go, "Oh, if that went into me, it'd be okay because there's a mattress on the front, and we all know it's all right, we got airbags." Yeah. yeah, so maybe it's part of that. Maybe there is something there where it finally gets to the point where it says, "I can't pull up in time. I'll trigger the airbag because I know I'm going to have to have that collision with that particular person." But the bigger picture here is just the concept of self-delivery vehicles, autonomous self-delivery yeah. vehicles. This is happening for people that think it's all something that happens in the movies in the future maybe. This is happening no, now. Happening. They've got their testing out there. This company at the moment is valued at about $8.6 billion. Wow. So some investors out there think there's some value in this company, and this is just one of the companies out there Goodness that are me. working towards this. So it's, it's happening. They're doing deliveries already in limited sample sp- sizes. They're doing the testing, obviously, but they're actually delivering pizzas, delivering uh, some supermarket products are delivering things out there right now, but just not on a large scale. That's amazing. I can just imagine um, crossing the road without thinking and uh, stepping in front of one of these things. You get, first of all, the fright of, oh, this car's going to hit me. And then you get the secondary fright of, bang, there's this airbag in my face. <laughs> that would be hilarious to see from the sideline. Yeah, yeah maybe, not, maybe not up close, but maybe from the sideline, yeah. as you say. And now it's time for our Splash of Cold Water to the Face cybersecurity wake-up segment, folks. The most common password list for 2021 has been released, which makes for somewhat sobering award ceremony indeed. Matt, I think if anyone listening to this uh, next bit hears one of their passwords read out, then they're going to need to literally give themselves an uppercut. I can't believe that not only are some people using these passwords, but they are the most common Hit us with it, Matt. Yeah, that's a bit scary. So this is based on 8.4 billion passwords across the world. So Mm. there have been various data leaks from time to time. So an organisation has compiled all those data leaks to say, let's have a look at all these data leaks. So these aren't just, oh, I talked to a couple of mates down at the pub and he told me a couple of passwords they were using. This is based on 8.4 billion passwords. So a fair bit of of data. data. Yeah, that's right. So number one on the list is... One, two, three, four, five, six. My God. <laughs> if you're using that, folks, and be honest with yourself, That's give right. yourself an uppercut right now. And then it gets worse. The second most common was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> and it goes through a range of numbers, one, two, three, four, five. We finally get at number four some letters involved. We get QWERTY. <sighs> <laughs> so, and well, then how did they come up with that? Matt? I don't know. I'm not sure what a random character is or a bunch of characters there. Number five is my, my favourite. It's uh-huh. always my favourite is password. People are being very clever. I know what I use for password. No one will ever think of using the word password for a mm. password. I'll use passwords. That was number five on the list. And the list goes down a range of numbers, all zeros. One that I thought was interesting, but it's still not that secure. Number 13 on the list was 
1Q2W3E. So obviously someone went, I know if I put the first three numbers and the first three letters from the keyboard, that'll trick them. So no, it won't. But good thinking there in some respects. And away you go. Now, if you wanted some advice around it, the best advice I would give is to make up an expression. Or remember with planets, I used to use my very elderly mother just saw a mnemonic pass. A mnemonic, exactly right. So if you take the first letter from all of those words, if you come up with that little expression, a little saying, whatever it might be, mm. then take the first letters of all those, mix it up a little bit with an upper and lower case and an other character, mm. put a number in there, make it at least 10 characters, and you've got a pretty strong password. Go to 12 characters, you've got a really, really strong password. Yeah. And then the really tricky part is use different passwords on different sites. Now, I know no one's going to do that. So if you do nothing else, and I've mentioned it before, just use a different password on your email password compared to everything else because often people will use an email to get the two-factor authentication. So if you at least have a different password on your email, if someone hacks your password for everything else, they might not be able to get that two-factor authentication. And it's easy to remember a sequence or a sentence uh, as well. You know, so if you just remember a common sentence that has meaning to you yeah. that, and you create a mnemonic from that, it's got no meaning for anyone else. I guess the problem with passwords is, is that either people think, oh, the stuff that I'm making this password for isn't that important, <laughs> so I don't mind, or no one's going to want to hack my stuff anyway. Why would they want to hack my stuff? Yeah, I'm not the President of the United States. Who cares about what I do? And Unfortunately, that's your fatal error. That's yeah. right. Unfortunately, there are bots out there that are constantly trying different sites, different passwords, and I use this really complicated concept that's called the kick yourself theory. If I lost access to my whatever it is, the password that I'm using for this site, how hard would I kick myself? And if you say, no, I wouldn't care, wouldn't matter, wouldn't kick myself at all, oh, sure, use one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm. If you say, no, I like the contents of my bank account to be mm. in my name and my control rather than someone else's, I think I kick myself pretty hard, then use something a bit stronger. And with so many things there that need passwords, they need passwords because they're trying to protect other information about you. Yeah. And this whole idea of identity theft, you only need a couple of couple of things to uh, to prove that you're someone else. Um, yeah. yeah and that identity theft is really difficult because lose a password, lose some money out of your account, lose access to your social media account, whatever, they're all bad it's things. It's replaceable. Lose your identity, yeah. then that becomes a major drama. So, yeah, I would advise our listeners to stay off the password list for next year. Make sure you're using passwords that don't appear on this list. I reckon, James, the, nec- the list next year will probably be pretty similar to the list this year. I know. But let's see if we can just change the world a little tiny bit and get people to just think about their passwords a bit. Yes, people, care a little bit more. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, James. <laughs> Now, I remember a conversation that I had with my sons two or three years ago. They're only about uh, maybe 11 or 12 years old, about what they might like to do for a career when they finish school. Matt, do you want to know what they both said? Yeah, I'd love to know. They both wanted to be YouTubers, oh, of course. They're not going to make any money out of that, James. It's going to be a real job, will you? <laughs> well, with that in mind, I just need to throw in the following disclaimer. Boys, if you're listening to this podcast, it is important to realise that what you're about to hear is the exception and not the rule. Matt... Talk us through the list of the highest earners on YouTube. Well, the first question I have for you is, have you ever watched or heard of Mr. Beast? I only heard of it through my son, and it was in the last week. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Well, he was number one on the list of YouTube earners. He was earning around $54 million. The last year earned about $54 million. US, $54 million. Dollar signs and fame, the two things that an adolescent wants most of all. (laughs) That's right. Now, he's 23 years old, earning $54 million a year. So he must be imparting incredible knowledge out there or really making a difference in the world. So if you go and watch some of Mr. Beast's stuff. He must be really giving something back to the people of the world. Yep. So what he gives back is some elaborate stunts. (laughs) For example, he took Squid Game and some of the various games they played on Squid Game and he went and played those games without the death aspect to them, but went and played those games with a group of friends. So people watched that and he made a lot of money out of it. I understand he spent $6 million on that clip. (laughs) And had special effects, like you yep. know, people had little packets of blood that blew up or whatever. I don't know, I haven't seen it, folks, so don't quote me on that. But he, uh, he does spend a bit of money on it, so I'm probably downplaying a little bit. He does put a fair but he's bit of money in He's got a big in income coming in as well. He and does. That's the problem that I'm trying to defend my boys from. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> he also hired a an eighty thousand 
stadium at one stage, which again, I'm sure they don't give you that for $5, and just played a game of hide and seek with some friends. So why not <laughs> go, go on to the MCG or the SCG and play hide and seek there? So it's those sort of things that are really making a difference in the world. But he's our, That reminds me of that Monty Python clip of the world's uh, world champion um, uh, hide and seek things. Guys, go and look it up on YouTube. <laughs> oh, well, somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, and check that out. The world champion uh, hide and seek. But anyway, keep going. <laughs> uh, so some of the people that are in this list are, I mean, 23 years old. Doesn't sound like he's too old, but that's a bit old compared to some of them. Number seven on the list is Ryan Kaji. He's the world's most famous toy reviewer, and oh, he I've heard about this kid. Yeah, so he he earns in the vicinity of twenty to thirty million dollars a year. He's been on the list for several years now, so it's not just last yeah, year. Yeah, he just yeah. opens boxes. Opens boxes. Ten years old, so, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not as bad as number six on the list. Nastia, a seven-year-old. She's got ninety million subscribers on YouTube. So yeah, some of these earners are. Just just, it's incredible. So imagine at seven years of age, earning in that vicinity at twenty to thirty million dollars. So if you look at the ten best paid YouTubers in twenty twenty one, they made a combined US three hundred million dollars. See, I can understand why it's so attractive. Yeah, because it seems like you can earn a lot of money from this with seemingly no talent whatsoever. <laughs> I think that's yeah. a prerequisite, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't really. You just need to to keep filming stuff until something catches. Yeah, that's right. And I think one of the problems that we've got now, as you say, someone spends six million dollars on a production for one of their YouTube clips. The old days, a few years ago, you could just go and do something as a bit of a stunt, or just mm. come up with a little concept and go and film it and stick it on YouTube. But now people are expecting the production values to be mm. so much higher. So it probably is a bit tougher to get into this list because you've got to spend a lot of money in the first place to get those production values up high enough. Now, it's not quite as easy to break in there, but this is the top 10. There are other people, and again, your children tune out right now, <laughs> my children as well. There are other people out there who are making reasonable money. They're making hundreds of thousands of dollars, not tens of millions, but yeah, that's not too bad to make a few hundred thousand dollars just out of doing a few things on YouTube, sticking it on there, coming up with something that's interesting, getting a bit of a niche following, and then suddenly if you it's a bit that, like that snowball. You keep pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. You mm. finally get to the top of the hill and then stand back, and the whole thing gets out of control and builds up to some incredible size. And that's what happens with YouTube or any social media site, really. You just have to push it for a while, and suddenly if you get it right – then away you go. But a lot of people out there don't get it quite right and they're still pushing years later. And, that, and that's the thing. And it's it's not like an ATM where you create a, a, a video and then people pay you money for the video. You've got to attract advertisers and advertisers want to advertise where it's been clicked the most. Yeah. I watched one YouTuber who was showing how much money he was earning having gotten a million hits. So a million hits, that's a lot of hits, right? Yeah. And he managed to rake in a dollar ninety in... Um, in revenue from the advertising. <laughs> so to go to the next level where you start earning millions of dollars is a long way. Yeah, that is. Now, keep in mind that YouTube, the power that YouTube has, I find incredible. There's 2.3 billion users worldwide, and YouTube says that about 1 billion hours of video content is consumed every single day. Yeah, isn't that amazing? There's no government out there that has got as much power as YouTube. YouTube can make an incredible difference in the world through you know things like Squid Game imitations, mm. but they can make an incredible difference in the world because they've just got so many people in the world that are using YouTube and they've got their content. So they, they could make a difference in a positive or a negative way in what they do and the information they put out there. So anyway, let's, uh, let's can this podcast concept and go YouTubing. <laughs> <laughs> That's our next step. And of course, there's big money to be earned in YouTube. Uh, it comes it comes down to how many views you gather. Baby Shark is the first YouTube video to pass, well, surpass, sorry, 10 billion views. Matt, I've only just said the name and the song's already I know, I know. It's the do, do, do part. <laughs> oh, no. And I'm sorry, listeners, it's in your head as well. And again, here's the thing. We've got this wonderful mouthpiece called YouTube that could get out there and really make a difference across the world and the number one video of all the videos that could possibly be the number one it's not a speech from Martin Luther King or not Nelson Mandela no. being released from prison it's Baby Shark with a song. And I can't sing, James. I'm not even going to do it, but it is in my head now, so I'm trying to get it out. Well, if you want to annoy someone, forget Rick Astley and his Rick Rolling and, <laughs> you know, never going to give you up. Yep. It's Baby Shark. Baby Shark. You just have right. to go, you know, singing that past someone in the office. That's right. But that's Baby Shark. When you look at, say, for example, the top 10 or 11 videos, there's a few that stuck out for me. Uh, Gangnam Style, 
That's uh, number, yeah, number 11, that actually. Classic from the past. $4.31 billion. At least yeah. it was actually a, a reasonable song, but yeah, I think yeah. it was more the dancing that got people watching it rather than anything else. Uh, you know, Uptown Funk is number nine, 4.43 billion views. Uh, Again, I give credit there because there's been an artist with some talent there. Yeah, that's right. Well done, guys. Yep. And then you get things like Shape of You. Like, I'm a bit of an Ed Sheeran fan. Shape yeah, of sure. You, 5.59 billion Whether you're, views. Yeah. And, and Gangnam Style, Up Down Funk, Shape of You, whatever. It might not be your cup of tea, but give them credit because you've got an artist who's working and writing and, and doing And so. people interested in watching it. But then you get Nursery Rhymes, Bath Song, number six on the list, 4.8. Eight billion this views. Incredible. Colourful eggs on a farm. Four point five five billion views. <laughs> just so many things that you just think. Really, if, if yeah. someone's seeing one of those nursery people. rhymes, people just go, oh, "That's pretty boring." There's not many different. Lyrics. Like Baby Shark, how many different lyrics are in there? Yeah, it's, it's, people, not that, people, people. it's not that. It's not that well constructed. A, a, well, obviously it is. People like it, but it just seems incredible to me that some of these do get up there on that list. So either that, or we're just giving our phones to three year olds and to keep them occupied. And they're going ad nauseum on them. Well, maybe that's it. I hadn't thought of that. Maybe it is just the fact that they're maybe babysitters now. So, yep. so well, of we'll those 10 billion we'll views for Baby Shark, none of those views have been remembered because they're all done by three-year-olds. <laughs> Goodness me. Well, let's move on to some other things now. Norway, the land of fjords and excellent salmon. Home of the Vikings and birthplace of Edvard Munch's famous work, The Scream. Now it appears that Norway have added another distinctive feature to its cap, They've taken to electric vehicles like no other country on the planet, folks. Matt, it's no longer of a case of who has an EV in Oslo. That's no longer special. It's now a case of who's been left behind with one of those old fossil fuel jalopies. Only 8% of those people are being left behind, James. 8%. 8%. So there's only 8% of new cars sold in the country at the moment that ran purely on gas or diesel. Listen up, folks. This is just quite incredible, isn't it? 66% of cars sold over there at the moment are purely electric and another 26% were hybrids. Mm. And I sometimes give friends of mine that get a hybrid a bit of a hard time. I go, oh, look, <laughs> have a go, will yeah, you? It's purists. only a hybrid. I mean, <laughs> it's really just still burning petrol, just a bit less petrol. But I think it's a good gateway to a full EV. Once people get the hybrid, especially plug-in hybrids, I've got a little bit more respect for a plug-in hybrid. Mm. So at least people get the idea of they're charging a battery, they're using that, and try and avoid using that petrol engine as much as possible, except for that long trip you go on. So oh, I can kind of live with those ones. Mm. The the hybrids that don't need to be plugged in, though, I kind of think, well, they're just a good economical petrol engine car. Mm. But yeah, when you get to the stage where only 8% of new cars sold are purely gas or diesel. It's amazing. And the people of Norway must be looking at you know, footage of modern Australia and looking at like we, we used to look at, you know, uh, documentaries of Bulgaria in the 70s. It's just uh, <laughs> crazy. I reckon the people in Norway don't even look at what's happening in Australia because <laughs> they, they, they're, they're just too think, busy driving their electric cars. That's right. Why would I bother about looking over there? And they've done a few things to try and get there. I mean, it hasn't happened overnight. They've had some strategies in place for a period of time, which is fantastic. And we're seeing the benefits of that now. It's called long-term planning and government, mm. I think. But they have had a few different things. So they have had some tax breaks. They've had stamp duty exemptions. They've had some rebates on vehicles. They've had strategies on some roads. Some initiative. The initiative, that's right. They've had strategies on roads where you might be able to drive in the bus lane, for example, if you've got an EV rather than driving the rest of the lanes with all the other cars. So they've put lots of these things in place, better parking spots for people, some charging infrastructure. Basically, all the things we know that you could do out there, Norway have said, well, let's do all of them. Mm. I wonder if that'll make a difference. Well, hello, it's made mm, a difference. Hello, yeah. So they are absolutely a world leader in all of these areas. And the thing that's really exciting about people that live in Norway is when any company says, we've got a new EV on the market, where should we take it first? Oh, Norway. They of seem course. pretty keen to adopt. So they're actually getting some of the new models from various manufacturers. Some of them are sort of testing out the market to see what the market thinks of them. Some of them are, we want to sell this car to get some of our R&D back, let's get it into Norway. So Norway is not a huge market in the whole world scheme of things for cars, but they are getting much better access, much, much better access to cars yeah. than we are at the moment. Excellent sampling audience, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. So Anyway, there's things that are happening there, there's things that we could learn from. Someone else has invented the wheel, let's just go and say we'll use that same wheel rather than try and recreate the wheel. No shame in that, folks. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> There's now quite a stigma attached to drinking with plastic straws, isn't, isn't there, Matt? Oh, absolutely. It's almost like if you're drinking with a plastic straw around people, they look at you like you just lit up a cigarette in front of them or something. Um, uh, they're thinking things like, yeah, what are you going to do with that when you're finished? Choke a turtle or something? 
<laughs> Plastic straws are so 2010. And let's face it, paper straws are a bit annoying too. They're like a countdown clock on your drink. You've got two minutes and 16 seconds to down that 380 ml iced coffee frappe before that paper does, straw dissolves straight into it. Drinking straw technology needs a solid kick in the bum, Matt. And it's time for some good news. What have you got for us? I've got bacteria. Why not? When Why you've got not? a problem, turn to bacteria. <laughs> How many times on this podcast do we look at, well, we don't look at it, but we've looked at examples where researchers have said, how does nature do something? Yeah. Can we steal the idea from nature and then use that? And so once again, this is an example. Researchers collected bacterial cellulose. They air dried it, dipped it in some sodium alginate. Then they basically created straws from that substance that was left there. It's actually sticky. So when they roll the straw, it sticks to itself. Yeah, right. And then at the end of it, and I don't necessarily advise this, but at the end of it, you can eat it. It's an edible straw, <laughs> but it stays solid in the drinking process. Like you say, paper straws, it sounds good, but they become soggy, and people just go, I'm not going to use that paper straw, so they turn back to plastic. So the solution is not really a solution when people mm. just give up on it. But these straws have the potential to be, well, they solve a few problems. First of all, it doesn't get soggy from being wet. So great tick, don't yep, worry about the paper side much. of it. Second thing is paper straws are quite expensive. So some businesses choose and we're not talking about a lot of money here, James, but some businesses choose to go with plastic straws still because they're still cheap. Mm. You're talking about maybe three straws per cent for a plastic straw, or paper straws might be you know, maybe a cent a straw. So, again, not talking yeah. about a lot of money here, but we're yeah, talking yeah. about difference. These straws can be produced at about the same price as a plastic straw. So tick takes away the price. And then at the end of it, what do you do with it? Well, it will get broken down in the environment. Or if you're really keen, just sit there and have a chew on your straw. I don't imagine they're that tasty, <laughs> but how long will it be before someone says, you know what, we could just that's put a bit flavor, of... Yeah. That's exactly right. Put a bit of flavoring in that straw. Would you like a strawberry-flavored straw with your strawberry-flavored strawberry milkshake? Yeah, right. <laughs> or would you just like a plain-flavored straw? So I can see some concepts there that will be different. But again, we've looked at nature and said, let's ha see how they do it and let's see if we can use some of that concept and absolutely they are not available yet you can't just go into your local Still store in the development and, phase yeah that's right but i think they're seeing that they can produce them in quantities produce them at price and get them out there and have a bit more care taking the environment i mean it, it doesn't sound like much does it you go, oh, straw what what difference does a straw make but it's all these little things james all these little absolutely. things that we do now that we could change and you add up all those little things and they add up to a big thing and the turtles will thank you. That's right. <laughs> I can see them now. Now, if you're in Barnaby Joyce's camp and you're still stamping your feet about how the future of energy is bogged in coal and gas, then you're really not going to like what's going to, well, what is happening in the rapidly growing field of renewables with massive offshore wind farms in the UK. Matt, the winds of change are blowing and not in the direction of industrial age technology, it would no, seem. They are blowing and they're blowing quite well. So this is in the UK, one of the world's biggest offshore wind farms is now in full operation. And we are getting some large ones. The UK authorities, they want 40 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity by 2030. And that sounds like a ridiculously large number, but when you start to get some of these offshore wind farms, so this one here, for example, is an 857 megawatt offshore wind farm, Wow, 90 wind turbines. So when you start to think, well, that's pretty close to a gigawatt, and they only want 40 gigawatts by 2030, oh, they'll do that pretty easily. Again, they've started down the process. They've started putting these out there. They've started them in production. So over the next eight years, I think they'll get to their 40 gigawatts quite easily. Mm. So you've got that sort of size. There's also another one in development at the moment, a 1.2 gigawatt a Hornsea 1 development, and that's uh, off Yorkshire. So that's got 174 turbines in it. But I guess people want to know, you know, I mean, you can talk about the amount of power that's released by these things, but people want to know how many houses is that going to power, though? A lot. 800,000 homes from this one particular one. So yeah, right. when you start to break it down, it doesn't take a lot of wind turbines to power a lot of homes. Yeah, so this is just off the coast of, of I don't know, do a bit of research, research on this one, off the coast of Lincolnshire. Yeah. And so you could power the city of Leeds 
and Sheffield, and I think Nottingham as well. And uh, I was looking at Derby and another little spot that I've forgotten about. But that's a lot of homes. It is, and your knowledge of English population density is much better than mine. Yeah. I'm assuming that, that all those places <laughs> you just mentioned add up to about 800,000 But I just homes. thought, you know, okay, well, you know, if we're talking about Dubbo, how many homes are in Dubbo? And, and what would that be meaningful? How would that be meaningful? Yeah. You're, you're, these are big established cities in the UK, and that's very meaningful to be and, able to and supply you, those houses. when you do break that down, so take Dubbo, for example, population of 42,000 in, in Dubbo City, and you've got about 12,000 homes. Mm. So 800,000 homes, wow. That's, that's Dubbo again and again and again yeah. for a lot of times before you say that's a fair few homes that are powered. Now, again, this is just one of those offshore wind farms, and there are multiple ones being built. And when you look at them, you think that looks like a fairly big area, but the ocean's big. And so when you start to look at some of the coastline of even just the UK, only a fairly small country physical size-wise, then you start to go, well, wow, there's a fair bit of potential there. So 40 gigawatts, 400 gigawatts, 4,000 gigawatts, you could generate a huge amount of power with mm. the wind that's being blown around just, say, one little country like the UK. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, when you do break it down, that's right. And it's a good point, James. You throw around some gigawatts, some megawatts, it doesn't mean a lot. But when you start to break it down to homes and how many homes you could power, yeah, wow, that starts to make a real difference. Absolutely it does. And uh, the time for making excuses is over, I think. <laughs> you haven't talked about local politicians, have you? <laughs> Sorry, let's move on. Gift card scams are bad enough. But when Google gets sucked in as well and a Google ad promotes a scam... It fools so many more people. Matt, how did Google accidentally approve an ad for a Target gift card scam? Dare I say it, that Google just like to take advertising money. Now, they do have processes in place, supposedly, that says if you're going to go and advertise a scam, advertising that's going to trick people, then they've got bots there that will pick that up. And they even mm. have some humans there somewhere that will actually look at it and say, no, I've done a bit of testing with this particular one, and it's not legitimate. But there's a scam going around at the moment that says check the balance on your gift card. And in particular, they were targeting Target, excuse the bad pun there, mm. a Target in America where you can just go and check the balance on your gift card. People like to do it. They've got a gift card. Some of them gave them the $500 gift card for their birthday, Christmas, whatever. There you go. Have a nice day. And you don't normally go and just buy one purchase. You use it a bit and yeah. then you, you've used it for a few weeks or a month and you go, oh, I wonder how much is left on that. I, I should just go and check. So the mm. first thing you do is you go and Google Target, Easy gift thing. card balance. Seems pretty ha harmless as well. It does, yeah. And something comes up. Well, I've Googled it and it's there, so it must be the right one to click on. So you click on that and you type in your details and then you find that you don't get the balance in your card. And when you finally get the right site, the balance is zero because as soon as those details go through, Dang. someone else has taken that money. So I would hope that Google is a bit stricter and has a few more controls in place to stop people doing this. But again, <laughs> just be yeah. wary of it. And I would normally say to people, don't trust a link. If you get an email with a link, hey, check your gift card balance, don't click on that link. Go to your web browser yeah. and actually type in a site or go to Google and search for it. I would normally give that advice now to people. You can't even trust Google. Oh, no. So what are we going to say to people now? Now you've got to get the full URL that you know is definitely the one from the site that you want to go to and type all that in because most people don't type URLs anymore. They just go to Google. Mm. Even if you know the URL, it's often quicker to go to Google, yep. type in a part of that particular company, and then there you go, click on that. So normally you would not type in the URL to check your gift card balance, but now I'm saying to people, uh, maybe go and type that in or just be a bit aware when you're type in something in Google and it comes up something, when you click on it, maybe just look in the URL. Because I, I think I'm dreaming if I'm going to get people to start typing in the URL. <laughs> but if you at least look at it and it doesn't look legitimate, then maybe be a Back bit away. wary of that. But oh, it's tough. But like, the scammers are good, James. Yeah, good. the bad guys are clever. Oh. I like the old days where the bad guys were always dumb. <laughs> that's, that's, you're talking about Pink Panther movies now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Inspector Clouseau or something like that. Some of the, the villains in some the of those villains movies. Those, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now, as social media networks come under fire for spreading misinformation or giving power to trolls and online bullies or, or even supplying a working platform for con artists and scammers, as we were just talking about, uh, the pressure on them to expose these people, that's the pressure on these social media networks to expose these people and to police their online territory, has been heavy to say the least. Well, now there is some pushback as Twitter and Snapchat warn governments off undermining online anonymity. Matt, this is messy. 
The government's actually been doing a pretty good job on this, James, taking on some of these social media giants. We know from past discussions about the news content and paying news providers for some of that content, and we had a win there, and other countries around the world are doing something similar, different mm. formats of it, but something similar. And this is the next big area, and I don't know the right answer to this one. Mm. The government is saying that we should... Well, sorry, they're not going that far yet. They're discussing the concept of saying that we should have to prove who we are before we go and register an account with a social media company. So, Well, you, at this stage, the level of accountability is up to you. Exactly right. You put your name as Billy Bloggs. Yeah, and you can be zero accountable. Absolutely and, right. And you can go and make random comments. And they start to get a bit tired on that. So, oh, no, you've got to use that one email account. Well, then people just go and create thousands of different Gmail accounts yeah. or Hotmail accounts, whatever it might be. So it's not that difficult to be a bunch of different people in the social media world. And then you can start to influence conversations because someone goes to a social media site and they go, oh, wow, James 1 and James 2 and James 3 and James 27 all have this really strong opinion about that. Gee, that might start to influence my opinion. And people yeah. think it wouldn't, but it does. When yeah. people read all these comments that are all similar, they might all be from the one person. So mm. from that point of view, I absolutely get where the government's coming from. I think, without a lot of data behind me, but I think it will reduce the amount of trolling, it will reduce the amount of abusive behaviour we see online because people have got to be themselves rather than be someone anonymous. But social media sites say that freedom of speech is taken away from people when they've got to expose their identity because they might be scared to say what they really think when someone says, hold on, James said that, I know James, wait till I go and see him next time, yeah. I'll give him what for. So suddenly... We restrict that freedom of speech. So you go, well, gee, maybe being anonymous is okay. So I can see both arguments here. But in the past, if you wrote a letter to the editor in one of those old-fashioned things called a newspaper, you had to say who you were. That's right. The newspaper didn't publish your full details to expose your name and address and phone number, but they didn't publish your letter to the editor if you sent it in anonymously. Mm. They needed to know that you were a real person. They might even sometimes say name withheld, but at least the newspaper knew that you existed. Yeah. So why do we do it so differently in social media where there are just a bunch of random people who know some of them might even be bots, some of them might be created by AI. There is a whole range of tactics out there that could be used. So I think this is interesting. Snapchat and Twitter have got lots of good reasons why it shouldn't be anonymous, or sorry, should be kept anonymous. And I can understand from their point of view because they just care about users. They just want to boast about how many users they've got. Yeah. If you made everyone actually prove who they were, that might suddenly reduce the number of people. And I think that happened to Donald Trump's account, didn't it? Suddenly when yeah. they started being a bit stricter about the people that were using the site, his users dropped down dramatically. Mm. Yeah, so it's a tough one going forward. It is, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, making people accountable is, is, uh, is, I think, an important thing. However, I agree with you. There are also that, that mess with being able to, well, allow yourself to say what you feel. Mm, that's yeah. right. And you've got to be confident of that. I mean, teenagers, when they're growing up, they're at mm. school and it's pretty hard for them sometimes to express themselves because in the teenage world, it's been a long time since I've been a teenager, but in that teenage world, you're really worried about what other people think of you. You might go home and be able to express yourself fully because you're anonymous, whereas you wouldn't yeah. do it if you put your name beside it. No, it's a tough one. Talk me through this now. Apple want to do everything. <laughs> now they want to be able to start my car. What the hell is this about digital car keys coming onto your phone? Well, they can do it now. They showed it off at, at launch last year. Then when they had a BMW there and they showed that you just use your Apple phone as your digital car key. So that was a good little arrangement they came up with. They had it exclusive to BMW. And that's the way the world's moving for example, if you own a Tesla, your key is your phone as well, and it just uses the, the phone, whatever brand you might have. But Apple's trying to do it a little bit differently. We've talked about Apple being used to unlock the key to your house, for example, unlock the locks in your house. But you thought, well, that's a niche sort of product there. BMW have got that. Mm. That's a, a nice upmarket BMW versus with a, an upmarket Apple phone. But Hyundai is now on it as well. Wow. So Basically, there'll be some Hyundais coming out that'll have that same feature where you can use Apple digital keys to unlock your Hyundai. Now, when you get to the <laughs> stage where it's Hyundai, which would I would say is a little bit more of a common car than a BMW, for example, other car manufacturers will get onto it. So this story to me is not so much about Apple using digital car keys. They've already been doing that. Not so much about Hyundai doing it. Well, that's great for them. It's about 
wow, this is where we're moving. It's Hyundai and BMW today. It's Ford. It's General Motors. It's Kia. It's a mm. whole range of different manufacturers tomorrow. Toyota's going to be in there at some stage because they don't want to be left behind like they are being an EV. So it won't be long, and you just won't need car keys for your car. It'll be your phone. Make sure your battery is charged. <laughs> yeah, well, you are living in the future, folks. You're there right now. Absolutely. It just makes another reason why when I lose my phone, I get really annoyed. <laughs> It might make you hold on to it more, but I suppose <laughs> the next part of that is that, as we talked about with the locking concept last week, if you get to the stage where your phone can unlock things, normally your watch can unlock things as well. So it's mm. a bit harder to lose your watch. You might notice it missing off your wrist. Your phone you can put mm. down somewhere, but your watch can still get you into things and find where your phone is as well. And off in the distance, I can hear the faint blast of the final siren. That's it for today, folks. The umpires have gathered up the game ball. The scoreboard has gone blank. So I guess we'd better head off too, Matt. No overtime play today. No overtime played on. I've got to now explain yet again to my sons why doing stupid stunts on YouTube is not a career that they want to have. I'm James Eddy, and it's been an absolute pleasure bringing you another episode of Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. <laughs>